I'm here today with Bob McAtee, and we're talking about facilitated stretching. Bob, your book's in its fourth edition. Yes. How has it grown and, and evolved over the years from the first three editions? Well, primarily, uh, I have learned a lot in the years since I wrote the first edition. I, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time uh, when I submitted a book proposal to Human Kinetics on a different topic, but it included a little bit of PNF stretching work in it. And they came back to me and asked me to write a book just dedicated to PNF stretching. So I was uh, honored and f a little flabbergasted because I, I was young in the field, so to speak. And um, uh, I wasn't even sure that I could do it. But I didn't say all that to them. I just said, yes, thank you very much. I'd love to do a book for you. And uh, you know, over the course of about a year and a half of writing and rewriting and uh, going back and forth, we came up with, uh, with the first edition. And in the course of the last 20 years, I've become a better writer, number one. I th at least I think I have anyway. <laughs> uh, I've learned more about the science behind the PNF work that facilitated stretching is based on. And over the years, just through uh, trial and error in my own practice, as well as in seminars where teaching the material, uh, a participant in the seminar would say, well, hey, what if we did it this way? And I went, oh, yeah, that's good. I'm going to... Thanks for sharing that. And so we kept evolving the stretching technique and the styles and the ways that we present facilitated stretching to uh, culminate now in the fourth edition. And what's wonderful, of course, is that 20 years ago there was no video available. Uh, in the third edition, we finally shot video that we included as a DVD with the book. And the fourth edition, it's all high-definition video that lives online. So you can access the video from any internet connected device. So that's just been awesome. Proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation or PNF stretching. Yes. First started out in the physical therapy realm. Right. Yeah. And yet it's something that has evolved so that coaches and people that have not studied physical therapy can still use it. Right. How does your <clears throat> book demonstrate those complex patterns or movements? so that maybe somebody that hasn't had a lot of background knowledge or has not studied that type of material can use this book. Great, thanks for asking me that. Uh, because I always like to clarify that proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation uh, came out of the physical therapy world. It was uh, created by uh, um, Dr. Cabot and his two physical therapists, Maggie Knott and Somebody Voss. <laughs> not in, so we'll figure that out. Uh, not in Voss published the textbook for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation that, that has been used since the mid 50s, I think with a couple of uh, updated editions uh, in physical therapy programs. So what's, what's happened is PNF is a broad uh, and deep modality for PTs to use. And the stretching piece is a very small piece of that repertoire. So the stretching is way more accessible to the non-PT, to uh, coaches, personal trainers, athletic trainers, sports massage therapists, as w and easily incorporated in into our practices, if you will. So my task was to take those complex my task was to take those complex ideas and patterns of motion and try to present them in a way that made sense to somebody who doesn't have that depth of background in the science uh, and in the physical therapy modality, so to speak. So that's, that's really has been the beauty of the book for me is um, uh, I was taught PNF stretching by a student by a physical therapist who, when she was a student, studied with Maggie Knott. So she, she came straight from the source, and she was able to teach it to us as sports massage therapists in a simplified manner. And then, of course, uh, it has gotten more complex in the terms of my presentation as I've learned more about it. You're doing some classes for ESU. Yes. And <clears throat> you have quite a few, you have a lengthy material online. Let's take something for the coach that I'm a soccer coach. Okay. 
I've seen your class. Yeah. Can you give me two drills or two exercises that I can use Monday for my practice out on the field? I can. Uh, one of the areas that we covered in the course was the spiral diagonal patterns, again, based on PNF, simplified and facilitated stretching, to uh, help to train synergistic muscle groups to work together. So out on the field, I would suggest two things. As part of the dynamic warm-up prior to practice, incorporate the spiral patterns for the leg in the dynamic warm-up because in the game of soccer, there's very little just straight ahead movement. There's all kinds of swervy, twisty turns. So you have to be able to have those synergistic groups fully warmed up and ready to go prior to practice. So that would be one exercise. The second exercise uh, would just kind of build on that if you're thinking about the, the strength training side is to use those patterns to help develop strength and resilience both in the uh, concentric activity of say moving the leg to kick the ball as well as to be able to resist the motion of uh, somebody pushing your player or bumping your player or the foot getting caught in the turf and they're going to end up with a groin pull because the muscle hasn't been able to be trained in that eccentric direction to resist that motion that's going to end up causing a strain if it's not properly trained. In your classes, I noticed that you also have some upper body. Now I work with volleyball athletes, and one of the issues that we have is the girls are always doing so much hitting, so much hitting. Yes. What would be two exercises that I could take and use in the gym with all, let's say, a, a stretching band that has a handle on each side, so I can clip it onto the wall, right? and then mm -hmm. the volleyball player will have the band. And whether it's high or low, I can move the band either way. What would be two exercises that I could use for my volleyball players? What I would consider in, in that particular case is they get a lot of hitting practice, right? So they've, they have well-developed anterior shoulder and chest muscles. What we find with hitting athletes or throwing athletes is lots of strength and uh, overdevelopment on the anterior side weakness and underdevelopment on the posterior side. So if we're looking at the spiral patterns of PNF, um, there, there really are, are a couple. There's two, actually. <laughs> if we look at the spiral patterns of PNF, there's two. And one of them would mimic, in a way, would mimic this, the strike of hitting the ball. So generally, when you hit the ball, again, you're not coming straight down, although you, that often happens. There's lots of cross-body hits. <clears throat> they get a lot of practice in this direction, but they don't get a lot of strength training for the posterior direction. So we would start with the band fastened low, mm -hmm. okay? And we would start, can I, let me yes. stand. Okay. We would start with the band low. This is a surgical tubing, a resistance band down, down at the low. floor. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have the athlete pull up and back like this to counteract the overdevelopment of the anterior shoulder because this is now working the backside of the shoulder girdle. So this is the concentric direction, right? Mm -hmm. And then your athlete also has to control the motion while the band is pulling her, she has to control the band coming back. And that eccentric work is what is really sort of the sweet exercise for helping to uh, strengthen the posterior side to help balance it off of the front. It also, again, helps protect from injury because, you know, after you strike the ball, your arm has to decelerate. And it's these muscles that decelerate the arm. And if they're weak in this eccentric direction while they're trying to break, mm -hmm. that's where you start to get sh shoulder injuries, rotator cuff injuries, impingement, etc. So that would be a, like a strength training exercise. Mm -hmm. And then you would want to focus on stretching the anterior shoulder all of these muscles that get overworked in the in the game during play you would want to focus on improving the flexibility and extensibility so that these tissues are more pliable have normal tone so that your athletes aren't walking around like this right and it, and again if i if i 
not to tell you your business, but it, you want to be looking at how to balance the muscles on uh, around that whole shoulder girdle or around that whole hip uh, pelvic girdle based on here's what my athletes do over and over and over and over. How do I counteract that activity which creates chronic shortening and hypertonicity in those muscles? How can we balance that and work the other side? That's interesting. A uh, uh, strength coach once told me, do what they don't. So do what they don't, exactly. If they rotate. If they rotate, okay. derotate. Yep. Yeah. And of course, both sides, right? Yes. You can't just train the right side. You just can't train the hitting side or the, throw or the pitching side. So if, whether you have a southpaw or a right-hander, you have to train both sides. And um, uh, I've been reading recently, and I, I, I can't quite remember who said this, but it's something about, you, yeah, you have to train the resistance to the motion uh, that they're, they're trying to do so that they have balance front, back, right, left. It's interesting you also mentioned that it seems like a number of the younger athletes, and I look more in the high school arena, yeah, but because of their notebooks, because oh. they're texting, everything they do, I call it being front side loaded. Everything yes. is up here. Right, right. In the book, do you have some exercises so we can open them up, so we can work on their backs? Absolutely. We have uh, stretches for these short, tight anterior tissues. And we have strengthening exercises, primarily based on using the spiral patterns to really focus on these posterior tissues. So instead of, uh, so again, um, you say front side loaded, we also can say we're sort of flexion addicted, right? There we go. Right? Nice. Boom, yes. like this. I stole that from somebody I, who's, <laughs> I should give credit to, but if I would remember. Uh, we're flexion addicted. Because it's not just notebooks, it's the phones, it's the computer, it's the video games, and driving. So <clears throat> it, it, sort of it really as a broad general rule, we want to lengthen the flexors, strengthen the extensors. Now that's our upper body. That's our upper body. However, think about how much, again, in the high school arena, yes. how much kids and adults yes. sit all day long. Yes. So in the book, do you have some specific exercises to help with our hip flexors, to work on some of our lengthening, or if I'm a hockey player, to work on some of those? We have, in addition to all of the spiral diagonal pattern stretches, we also have single plane stretches that focus on a single muscle or muscle group that do an activity. So uh, <clears throat> even though motion is always three-dimensional, it's never just in a single plane, mm -hmm. sometimes we find that certain tissues, certain muscle tissues in that three-dimensional plane are what are limiting the motion. So then we can focus on s focusing, so then we can focus on stretching those muscles. So for instance, if you have uh, somebody who sits a lot, and don't we all, <laughs> sitting is the new smoking as they say, yes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, to lengthen out hip flexors, uh, we have specific stretches based on the PNF principles in which we lengthen the hip flexors, then from that lengthened position we have the athlete isometrically contract the muscle because that engages that muscle tissue in a way that helps it to uh, then relax when we do the stretch for that. And so we're trying to incorporate some of the neurological feedback that's already built into our bodies. That isometric contraction prepares the hip flexor to stretch and then we use the hip extensors to actually do the stretch so that we're encouraging that communication from the front side to the back side. And what we find a lot is people with tight hip flexors also often have uh, very hypermobile low backs, for instance. And so um, it creates this condition that creates lots of anterior pelvic tilt. So the hip flexors are tight. They tend to pull the t pelvis anteriorly because of where they attach. And then uh, there's additional stress on the low back. So if we can get the anterior pelvic tilt organized a little more neutrally mm -hmm. uh, by lengthening hip flexors, strengthening extensors, it creates lots of success. Facilitated stretching in its fourth edition. 
approximately how many exercises or drills are in this manual? You call them drills. We call them uh, strength training exercises and stretching exercises. Okay. So we have about 50 stretches that the athlete can do on their own. Okay. Still based on the PNF protocol of an isometric contraction followed by a stretch to a new range. Mm -hmm. There's 60 some partner assisted stretches. Uh, and facilitated stretching as, men, as most PNF stretching techniques are typically learned and used as partner techniques. So an at, one athlete will help another or a coach or a trainer will stretch an athlete. But we want the athlete to be able to do those on their own in their own flexibility program. So that's why we have both the, con, both the partner assisted work as well as teaching the athlete how to do it for themselves. And I noticed that you have <clears throat> videos online do they show the exercise? Do they show the stretching as well? Or is this something that's different in addition to? The online videos are demonstrations of the stretches that we have in the book. And, uh, so in the book, we have a, f a photograph or two, mm -hmm. written instruction on how to perform the stretch, and then a link to the online video so that the, uh, the reader can then go watch the video demonstration. And if they want to read along, um, the other nice thing about the book is uh, we have a whole instructor package. So if, if a school adopts this book as a text, we have additional information available for, t for the instructors, including um, written exams, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and some additional ancillary products that they can use in their classroom. We could actually use this as our textbook if we had an exercise physiology or a basic athletic training class, yes. this could be a three or four week segment within that class. Yes, it could. And many, many athletic training programs have adopted the book in, in that very same way. Uh, many massage schools have adopted the book in that way if they're focusing on sports massage training. To wrap this up, yeah. give me <laughs> three interesting facts about the book that I pick this up, I'm at a conference, I pick up the book. I'm looking through it. What were three interesting facts that make me want to buy this book? Facilitated stretching teaches a form of PNF stretching which relies on the athlete to be totally involved in the process. It's, which means that you as the coach uh, do not have to do the stretching for, you, you are not stretching your athlete. You can teach your athletes the technique and they can work on each other under your supervision. So because the athlete who's stretching is actually actively doing that work, it's very safe in terms of uh, potential injury. Mm -hmm. That being said, everybody still has to be paying attention. Yes. Right? We don't want the partner texting on the phone while they're trying to stretch their work. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> because of the other resources uh, available to, in, to teachers, uh, if, this, uh, if a school adopts this book, you could build a whole curriculum just around facilitated stretching for certainly, there's enough material uh, that you could uh, present it in pieces over a whole semester if you wanted to because we have the dynamic flexibility work we have learning the spiral patterns. We have learning the anatomy of all the muscle groups because we have illustrations and tables in the book that show what muscle does what, where it attaches, origin and insertion. So you have the anatomy review. Uh, you, could, you could teach a few stretches per week or per class. Have your athletes practice, practice, practice so they get really proficient by the end of the, the, the uh, semester. Uh, the other thing that I would say to you is like, the book has sold over 100,000 copies worldwide. Why don't you have it yet? <laughs> Please. Here we go. <laughs> we have the book. It yeah. passes through ESU. Yeah. And of course, you have your Twitter page. Yes, I do. Um, at, if, at Bob McAtee. At just at Bob McAtee. At Bob McAtee. And then do you have a Facebook page also? I also have a Facebook page. So there's many different ways that people can contact you or resources that they can get online and find if they sure. have any other questions. And they can go directly to my website, stretchman.com.
That's S-T-R-E-T-C-H-M-A-N.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate the conversation.